I felt so hot in my gang sweater. The first thing I ever had Taylor made for me. I was 15. Uh, the only thing ever I had Taylor made for me, now that I think about it. We called ourselves the Latin Chantels. We were the chicas and Latin Chancellors. We wore uh, black sweaters, the hip length, and it was bad. When the best part about it was the emblem. It was some big puffy rendition of some long time ago coat of arms. And it was designed by Lemons. He was the warlord of the Latin Chancellors. <laughs> I felt so cool in my gang sweater. I wore it with a black tight stretch pants with a strap around the foot. I knew I looked cool in that. So cool that the first day I wore it, Lemons asked to walk me home. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I could barely breathe. <laughs> But when he was walking me through the dark Chicago streets, I felt so cool. When he pulled me into a doorway and began kissing me, I was thrilling. And then when he began kissing me, I shuddered and he put his hand under my blouse right under the emblem he had designed. I figured it was meant to be. But Lemon never spoke to me after that day. He fell madly in love with Irma the president of the Latin Capris. Their sweaters were black with purple trim. Cool. I got my first pair of boots when I was 14. They were suede, and they answered to my need of being identified as a brooding, wounded, but potentially brilliant artistic species of female. <laughs> my dog, Corky, mistook them for an entree and chewed a hole in them. <laughs> so I took the bus to Sausalito and I got a new pair. They were olive green leather and came up over my knees. <laughs> By the time I got to Berkeley where I was an art student, I was all boots all the time. And I wore them with really, really short skirts. <laughs> I felt my boots gave me a kind of, oh, poetic, mysterious, bohemian kind of charisma. Tough but tender, rugged but sensuous. I was poetic, but unselfconscious, like Joni Mitchell. <laughs> that was a really happy time in my life. Ah, but then, one night, a guy broke into my apartment when I was sleeping and raped me. Ah, they never caught him. And I never had any reason to think that he saw me before that night, but ever since the rape, whenever I walked down the streets of Berkeley in my short skirts and my boots, I just felt like everyone was staring at me. So I gave all my short skirts to Goodwill. But not the boots. I love the boots. What do you think? Does this go in or out? What is the wank? <laughs> I can't even zip it up. The only reason I can't zip it up is I have my period. Oh my god, I'm <laughs> the size. This will fit if I lose like five pounds. This will fit if I lose ten pounds. This will fit if I have a lipo. This doesn't fit. Dara, you think this can be let out? This doesn't fit now, but I always lose weight in May. I don't know who this is coming for, but I'm a six. I've always been a six. Does this come in an eight? Does this come in a 12? Does this come in a 14 slash 16? Does look pregnant? I can't decide. What color is this? Oh, I can't wear gray. Yellow makes me look sick. I look so <laughs> pale and green. It's so red. It's so red. Is this black or navy blue? I can't buy another black turtleneck sweater. I can't buy another white t-shirt. I look like my mother. <laughs> what am I supposed to wear this? Does this match? If you're not buying that, um, could I try it on? Does this run small? Is there something wrong with the lighting in here? <laughs> Is this mirror type distorted? It doesn't fit. I can't wear anything without sleeves. I can't wear anything low cut. 
My arms, what happened to my arms? <laughs> if my elbows face forward, I could kill myself. <laughs> my butt is falling. <laughs> is my butt falling? Oh my god, my butt fell. <laughs> I can't decide. I can't decide. I can't decide. I can't decide. <laughs> Last summer, I lost my my favorite shirt. Or to be more accurate, my favorite shirt vanished into thin air. When I got home from being away for the summer, I unpacked my bags, and the shirt simply never materialized. I have replayed the sequence of events in my mind several times. And I have theories about what happened to it, but the fact remains that the shirt just ceased to be. The really sad part was that this came at the end of a summer when that shirt gradually revealed itself to be the perfect shirt. It was flattering. I always felt pretty in it. I liked the color and the cut. It went with all my favorite pants. It was casual and dressed down, but not crappy and falling apart. And it was comfortable. It was one of those shirts you have to make yourself not wear because it seems every day's outfit would be improved by it. And as silly as it may sound, I am generally happier when I have clothes like this in my life. When there's something I know I can put on and feel good in, something to fall back on. And when I realized the shirt was gone, I couldn't think of anything else I owned that served remotely the same function. And I felt cheated out of something truly rare and precious. <clears throat> I realize that I sound like I'm talking about death or lost love. Uh, and maybe I am. It's probably worth noting that my relationship with my boyfriend ended at just the same time that I lost my shirt. But I could have sworn to you at the time that I was not transferring my feelings about the loss of my boyfriend onto the shirt, but was actually more in the loss of the shirt itself. The main lesson to be learned from this experience came from the purchase of about eight different shirts, which each had some likeness to the lost shirt, whether it be in color, cut, material, or casualness. But um, none of them in any way replaced it. And I eventually had to resolve to be thankful for the time I had with the shirt. <laughs> <laughs> At least I know what I'm looking for. The pink satin. Princess style dress I bought in Filene's basement in Boston for my marriage to Harry M. Johnson. I was 20 and Harry was 37. Uh, Harry was my sociology professor at seven. <laughs> we were married at his best friend's house in Dobbs Ferry. There was no food, only champagne and wedding cake. My grandmother and Aunt Babby came to the wedding. My grandfather wouldn't come because he thought Harry was too old for me. And besides, he was Catholic. Well, here are the words my grandmother uttered on this occasion. You're killing us! <laughs> so one day I was coming down the front steps from our apartment, and there was Walter Fenton. He had joined the Navy. He looked more handsome than ever in his uniform. Gingy, he said. Why did you do it? He <laughs> kissed my cheek and my hand, and then he walked away. I would love to be able to tell you that nothing good ever happened to Walter Finn, but he ended up being a used car salesman. But the truth is, he won a Pulitzer Prize. <laughs> <laughs> iridescent brocade Chinese style dinner dress. I bought in Cambridge for a New Year's Eve party. Harry convinced me to buy this dress even though it was very expensive. He said it showed off my arms and Harry thought my arms were pretty. 
The party was at the home of Harry's friends, Penny and Ecky. I idolized Penny. She was married to Ecky. She carried a diaphragm in her purse, <laughs> which was very cool but strange. I mean, I wondered about it at the time, because isn't the whole point of getting married that you don't have to carry your diaphragm? <laughs> well, anyway, at midnight I got very upset because I couldn't find Harry. Well, then I saw him. He was kissing Penny. Harry, I said, and you know what he said? Well, of course you know what he said. He said, it's not what you think. <laughs> but it was exactly what I thought. So that was that. I was 21 years old. And I was going to be the youngest divorced woman in America, except for Elizabeth Taylor. <laughs> In the beginning, I remember the jewelry more than the clothes. When I met Ray, we were both married, and we worked at the same truck dealership. He used to say that falling in love with me was like lettuce. Because when he was a kid, he had colitis. And for a long time, he wasn't allowed to eat any roughage. And he missed him. When he was finally allowed to have it, his mother introduced it slowly little bit of lettuce at a time. And he described eating that first plate of lettuce as almost like a religious experience, relishing the sound, the taste, the smell, the look, and like he was coming alive. So the first gift he gave me was a ring he had made that spelled lettuce. <laughs> L-E-T-T-U-C-E. I still have it. It's a little bit tight. <laughs> anyway, before we even slept together, he told me about how he was in trouble and he'd been arrested. He was probably going to jail. And then he told me all over again because he wanted to make sure he hadn't misled me. But all I could think about was how much I wanted to go to bed with him. <laughs> and I wasn't shocked that he was going to jail because remember, I'm a gorman. My people were always doing things. <laughs> my grandmother and my mother were arrested for making gin in a bathtub. <laughs> my aunt Bernice, who was a policewoman, was thrown off the Baltimore Police Abortion Squad for arranging abortions. <laughs> and my cousin Davey faked his own funeral to get out of his car payments. <laughs> so Ray and I, we fell in love. He left his wife, I left my husband. And Ray got sentenced to seven years. <laughs> but thank God, at a minimum security prison, I went up to visit him every weekend. Sometimes I wore a special pair of pants I had, loose-fitting brown cotton. And I made a hole in the crotch for easy access by Ray's finger. <laughs> Obviously, Ray didn't get much from this except the satisfaction of pleasing me. But he always wanted to show me that even in jail, he could take better care of me than someone who was not in jail. <laughs> and of course, he wanted to hold on to freedom. Get away with it. Put over something on the guards. That was the best part. Because they were so horrible when they checked you in. They frisked you. They went through your bag like they controlled you. Which they did. Ray got out of prison after two and a half years. I picked him up that day, wearing a pair of knee-high caramel-colored boots and a raincoat. Ray comes down, he looks at me, he's got this grin from year to year because he knew I had nothing on underneath. The guards didn't know. Uh -oh. By the way, we just celebrated our 20th wedding anniversary. I'm a state senator. Ray is a life coach. <laughs> he coaches people on their life. If he lived where we live, you'd know us. But you wouldn't know the story. <laughs> I always wanted a pair of black cowboy boots. I thought they'd make me sort of rangy and taller, like a girl named Slim that a guy could really go for. So one day I wandered into Walker's Western Wear and bought a pair of Nakonas. Beautiful stitching on the side, shit kicker pointy toes, 200 
The salesman said they'd be good for my arches. I have terrible arches. She's obsessed with her arches. <laughs> my older sister, she's always been obsessed with her arches. My younger sister. <laughs> a month later, I met a guy I fell in love with, Chase. He owned six pairs of black cowboy boots. Not Nakona's, but still really nice Tony Llamas. As fate would have it, he turned out to be the same guy I'd just seen standing against a door column at a party at the architecture school. It was Halloween. Don't leave that out. He had a chainsaw across through his torso. How could she resist him? She couldn't. He was sort of a freckly prepster, and since I was freckly too, there we were meant to be with our freckles and black boots, skinny, <laughs> freckly arms all entangled. She followed him to Seattle. He invited me. No, no he, he did, did not. not. <laughs> One of the reasons he wanted to move west was to get away from his incredibly dysfunctional family in Connecticut. Although, if I ever said his family was dysfunctional, he would say, Hold it right there. My family is not dysfunctional. <laughs> if you want to talk about dysfunctional families, what about your family? What about your sisters? What about your sisters who hate me? Which we did. Because of the way he treated her, but he wouldn't have treated her that way if she hadn't allowed it. We discussed it for hours. Behind her back. What a jerk he was. Why is she in love with him? Why? 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 He... Where was I? His incredibly dysfunctional family. No. Right. <laughs> so he said, If you're going to insult my family, I'm out of here. And she said, <laughs> Don't go. Please don't go. Please don't go. I didn't mean it. I love you. I love you. I love you. <laughs> it's always threatening to leave. And every time she said, Don't go, please. Don't go, please. Don't go. I didn't mean it. I love you. So guess what? He stayed. After a while, I began to suspect that he was actually in love with his family and not with really with me at all. He'd go home for the holidays without me, bearing gifts I'd helped him shop for, and he'd come back with old Shetland sweaters that reminded him of his childhood. But what I really wanted was for him to come back with the realization that he'd missed me horribly. He couldn't live without me. He wanted to marry me. He loved me. Or failing any of that, at least he someday wanted me to meet his fucking parents. <laughs> Which I finally told him in those very words. And he said, If you're going to insult my family, I'm out of here. And she said, Fine. Isn't that amazing? Fine. Go. Split. Who cares? And take those fucking boots with you. <laughs> and he left. Just like that. After seven years and seven horrible Christmases, at which point he owned 12 pairs of Tony Llama boots, most of them with holes, and I still had my well oiled, well cared for Dakotas, he kept the Shetland sweaters and his childhood memories, and I left town and found a good shrink in Los Angeles, <laughs> where we live. <laughs> I have nothing to wear. <laughs> nothing! Nothing fits. <laughs> nothing fits me. Why did I buy this piece of shit? Where is it? Why can't I find anything in my closet? I hate my clothes. Why do I buy such terrible clothes? I have to clean out my closet. I absolutely have to. <laughs> I should throw this away. After all, I haven't worn it in two years. Three years. <laughs> Five years. I can't do it. My mother gave this to me. Who does she think I am? I can't find my black turtleneck sweater. Where is it? I can't find it. Now he's sweating. Why didn't I hang this up? Now I have to iron it. I have nothing to wear. Who bought this? <laughs> Who did I think I was when I bought this? I totally forgot I bought this. <laughs> I didn't ever go through this. Choosing the sweater, I'm choosing the sweater. Choosing the sweater, I'm choosing the sweater. Of course they don't. What's wrong with me? Where is it? I have nothing to wear. I have nothing to wear. I have nothing. 
to wear? Nothing. <laughs> After I got divorced, I moved back to New York and I lived with Dora, who was studying to be an actress. <coughs> Gingy, you are the second youngest divorced person in the world. And you must act as if you couldn't care less. I had no idea what Dora meant. What I mean is, don't go and marry the first person you go out with just so you no longer have to be divorced. Well, don't be ridiculous. Now, why would I do that? Are you listening to me, Gingy? This is the yellow ochre sack dress that Dora lent me when she fixed me up with Al <laughs> Beckerman. <laughs> He's very sweet, but don't marry him. Are you listening to me, Gingy? <coughs> Floral print cotton cocaine dress I purchased at a very sweet <coughs> store in New Canaan, Connecticut for my marriage to Al Beckerman. <laughs> <laughs> my grandmother and Babby came to the wedding, but my grandfather wouldn't come. No, he was still mad at me for marrying Harry. <laughs> that was so sweet. He's very sweet, I said to Dora. And she said, I know he's very sweet, but are you sure? He'll take care of me. I know, but are you sure? We both want a big family. How big, Gingy? Black and red print half of a maternity dress. <laughs> uh, first worn when I was pregnant with Isabel. And then when I was pregnant with Lily, <laughs> Michael, Joe, <laughs> Julie, <laughs> David died when he was 18 months old from a 48-hour intestinal virus. Your son has expired, they said, when they called from the hospital. Your son, baby, your son has expired. Well, after David died, everything changed. I ordered this beige wool pantsuit from the Spiegel catalog. It was my first ever mail order purchase. <coughs> well, I thought it would be a good interview outfit because now that the children were in school, I wanted to go to work. Well, I got a job at an ad agency, and one day I walked into the office, and a man was sitting at my desk. He had a glue stick in his hand, and he said, do you know how to open this fucking thing? <laughs> well, it was as if Cupid had shot an arrow right <laughs> in my heart. <laughs> Fuck, he said, and laughed. Later that day, I found out his name was Stanley. So there it was. First Walter, then Harry, then Al, then Stanley. Oh, this may be my all-time favorite dress. A print jersey Diane von Furstenberg wrap dress. There is a reason Diane has updated this in her new dress. <coughs> I mean, it's easy to put on, very comfortable. You gain a few pounds, it still fits. <laughs> oh, I was wearing it the day I told Al that I couldn't stay married to him anymore because I was in love with Stanley. It, it wasn't really Al's fault. Al really was so sweet. There was, for a very brief moment in time, the paper dress. And I had one. I got it at Paraphernalia, which was Betsy Johnson's first store on 67th and Madison. It was a kind of grayish plaid sheath. I wore it to brunch at my cousin Marty's. He was an advertising executive who had just married Steffi, whom he put through medical school. Then she ran off with a doctor. <laughs> they were very impressed with my new dress and how oh courant I was. Then I wore it to Paula's sisters, Janet, and her new husband, Earls, who invited me and Paula to dinner at their newlywed apartment, which contained their newly upholstered dining room chairs. In the middle of dinner, I got my period suddenly and violently. And when we all stood up, there was a blood stain on one of the prized new chairs. 
For history, I should say that the dress was completely intact, just wet. It must have been the predecessor to bounty paper towels. <laughs> anyway, when I stood up, Janet said something like, What? And I said something like, What? As though nothing had happened at all. I then left the room for the bathroom. God knows what the three of them did, because I never acknowledged to anyone that anything out of the ordinary had happened. Although, I will remember this on my deathbed. <laughs> Why does weight matter so much to us? Either you have too much of it, or not enough. I was a chubby kid. Oh, I was a skeleton. Not just thin, but skinny, which would have been fine if I had breasts, but I didn't. I go off to college. When I come back on holiday break three months later, I gain 20 pounds. <laughs> I tried to eat, but nothing stuck. There's a machine in the dormitory cafeteria called the cow. <laughs> you press a nozzle, out comes the coldest, most delicious milk you've ever tasted. And also, there's sticky buns and popovers and scones. There's butter everywhere. You <laughs> retain water once a month. Now nothing fits except for my wool plaid Pendleton pleated skirt, which makes me look even fatter. It's tragic. My father takes one look at me as I get off the plane. He says to my mother, well, maybe somebody will marry her for her personality. <laughs> <laughs> so I went to a shrink, and she said, if you ever got happy, you would gain weight. And she also said, this is all because of your mother. My mother? I'm thin because of my mother? Yes. Couldn't it be my metabolism? No. <laughs> I come back for the summer and I'm still fat. None of my clothes fit. I already said that, but because now it's summer, I can't even wear my wool plaid Pendleton sleeves. <laughs> so I go over to my friend Janice Gladman's to borrow some clothes from her. Janice has always been overweight. I try on a pair of her pants. Can't even zip them up. <laughs> Here are Janice's exact words to me. Ha, ha. <laughs> <laughs> Next day I go on a diet. I've been on a diet ever since. <laughs> I have a picture of me and my first husband on a bench in Washington Square Park. I'm wearing my lime green coat, really short, and a plaid scarf. And I look so happy. But I was never really happy with David. Every time I look at that picture, I think about how photos lie and how so many marriages are just performances. By the time I married Kenny, I'd lost a lot of weight. Kenny didn't care what I looked like because he was gay. He would have married me if I had two hands. <laughs> <laughs> or wore my mother's wedding dress with, fits with some adjustments. It was an absolutely gorgeous dress. Ivory satin, plain with long sleeves, lace insets that came to a point and a great long train. Just as I was getting into the dress before the wedding, the dressmaker pricked her finger on a needle, just like in Sleeping Beauty, and got blood on the dress. My mother got an ice cube and out came the blood stain. I wore the dress at my wedding. My sister wore it at hers. My older daughter wore it at hers. Till finally it got down to my younger daughter, Jenny, who said, no way in hell am I getting into that bad luck dress. <laughs> so we had a dress designed for her by Vera Wang for her wedding. And Jenny got divorced too. <laughs> we all got divorced. My whole family. Everybody except my mother. Who stayed married to my father. For 56 miserable years. <laughs> I was married to David for three years when I began to endlessly fantasize about tragically and miraculously losing him. <laughs> Every time he was five minutes late, automobile accident. And when he'd cough, TV. <laughs> Every time he went to a party, I hoped he'd go in the kitchen and kiss one of my girlfriends and run off with her. But they never really liked him. <laughs> You are ambivalent. Ambivalent? I was not remotely ambivalent. 
You are ambivalent. You really love him. You are just too neurotic to realize it. <laughs> I was neurotic, but not because I didn't love my husband. I was neurotic because I was pretending to love my husband when I really didn't. After six years, David and I split up, and I got rid of my shrink. I mean, fuck you! <laughs> when I married Henry,